I won't, I won't keep you too long today. I was only aiming for about three hours, maybe a little shy. And after that, we'll be on our way, and we'll get out of here. Uh, of course, you know as well as I do, I don't have any idea what time it is. And uh, I preached at Temple One Churches one time. I had a clock on the back wall, but I never looked at it. I didn't know what that was there for. Uh, plus, it's so far away. Just couldn't make out those numbers on it, you know. <laughs> But uh, thank God we're on God's time. This is the Lord's day. But um, I'm going to be, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a, a great big message. I just a, a thought that the Lord's laid upon my heart. And so Ruth chapter number three, if you'll get there. Um, I love the book of Ruth. Anybody that's been at, at Elmira uh, should know that I love the book of Ruth um, because I love the book of Ruth. And uh, it's, it's a great book. And so let's look here if we can in Ruth chapter number three, and we're going to think about just a few things here uh, in this story. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of instruction here in, in uh, Ruth chapter number three, and we're just going to hit um, some of these instructions. A couple of things it says in verse number one: Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down to the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. But when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. She came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And I don't think there's a, a more tender ver, uh, statement in the Bible than uncover thy feet and lay thee down. And he lay right at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and he turned himself, and the whole woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou followest not the young men, whether rich or poor, rich, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now it is true, I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he'll perform unto thee the part of the kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until morning. And she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. He, and also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast on thee, and hold it. When she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her. And she went into the city, and came. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For this man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I'm thankful for the Lord, the, the story that we read here. I'm thankful for the singing we've heard today. I'm thankful for just to be with your people. God, I love being in church. I love being with God's people. And Lord, today, Lord, we welcome you here. Lord, I know, uh, Lord, you've been here already. But Lord, I, I want you to be here. I want you to do what's needed in every heart and life. I want you to change us. Lord, I want you to make us different than we are. I want you, Lord Jesus, to save the sinner. I want you, Lord Jesus, today to draw uh, the backslider back into fellowship with you again. I want you uh, to take your finger, Lord, and point places in our hearts, Lord, where we can be more and draw closer and do better. God, I want you to have reigning right away this morning. There's no ability in me, and I know that. God, there's no ability in anybody in this building, Lord. I'm just a sinner saved through and by your grace. And I thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, have your perfect work today. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll be seated. Thank you for your reverence, the word of God. As I said already, Ruth is, is, is one of my favorite books of the Bible. 
I think a person could probably preach a year or two just out of the book of Ruth if, if they was to, was to do a little digging. I know a lot of, a lot of men that have. Um, but Ruth also is one of the most prophetic books of the Bible. I don't know if you realize that because the, uh, the threshing floor represents the judgment of God. Uh, and, and, but you know where, where the Bible says Ruth was on the, the threshing floor, which was represented judgment, she was at the feet of Boaz, which represents Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. So oh, she was down there where judgment took place. She was at the feet of Jesus. And I want to say that during the judgment of God on this world, I want to be found at Jesus' feet. Amen. 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 Ain't no better place to be. Now, I've done a lot of preaching out of the book of Ruth, and, and, I, and, and uh, I heard a lot of good preaching out of the book of Ruth. I've preached on grace. I preached on a shoe. Uh, I preached on our kinsman redeemer, which was mentioned many times in this. I preached on the beginnings in Bethlehem, even at Christmas. I preached out of the book of Ruth. There's a lot of good things. You can't even go to the book of Matthew and preach a Christmas story on the genealogy of Christ without reading about Ruth because yeah. what God done for a lot of good things in Ruth. It's easily overlooked because it's a little thin book. As a matter of fact, when I was having you turn there, I was having a little trouble finding it. Uh, I, mean, I knew where it was, but it's just such a small book in your Bible uh, that is there. Uh, but it's the eighth book of the Old Testament, Ruth is. It's the eighth book of the Old Testament. Number eight means new beginnings. Amen? And so eight has to do with the resurrection uh, when we think about new beginnings. And what I mean by that, um, uh, eight always represents that. The, the eighth note in music is the first note of the next octave. It's the new beginning when, when you look at music. Uh, there's eight covenants in the Bible, and the eighth one's the new covenant. Amen? Amen? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a new beginning for us, the covenant that, that we're under. Seven covenants are under the law. The eighth one, eighth one got us out from under the law. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that, that we don't have to do that. And uh, the eighth covenant was the grace of God. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, the first day of the week, Jesus rose. That was the eighth day. And, uh, and uh, the Jesus uh, began again on the new day. I remember when I got saved and the sun began to rise in my heart. I, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. I had a new beginning, amen, because of what, what Jesus did. Uh, in John chapter number 8, there's a woman called in adultery in the very act, and they brought her to Jesus, and you know what Jesus did? He gave her a new beginning, amen. I'm thankful for what God does. The, if a leper was cleansed, he's cleansed on the eighth day. It's a new beginning, amen. You'll follow it all the way out of the Bible. Noah, the eighth man from Adam, he come out of that ark on that shore. It's a new beginning. Uh, you'll find it true all the way through as you go through Scripture. We'll find that I'm just not, I'm just saying the roots of the book of new beginnings. It's as uh, uh, simple as that. And I, I've said it before. It's, uh, the book of Judges is right before Ruth, and the book of 1 Samuel is right after the book of Ruth. And, and I, I like it, and you've heard me say, say it before. The book of Judges was a period of time when man was, did what was right in his own eyes, and and it's a book of gloom. And, and in 1 Samuel, they do away with the judges and they get their first king and, and they get uh, a period of time of glory. But in between gloom and glory, you have grace. And that's the only way you can get from gloom to glory is through and by grace. Amen. 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 And, and so uh, I, I like that. I, I'm glad that uh, we live in a world full of gloom right now. Uh, but I'm heading somewhere, you understand, to glory. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way because of what my kinsman redeemer done for me. But the only way I'll get from gloom to glory is through grace. Amen. 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 There is no other way for me to get there. Uh, I'm glad. The law says we can't get in, but grace took us the rest of the way. And I'm thankful Amen. for what grace did. I'm glad it came looking for me. Amen. Amen. Ain't you? You lost and undone and your sins didn't deserve nothing. Even the people that knew you didn't like you. But Jesus came looking for you. Could you imagine that? Amen. What a great Savior we, we serve. If you read the book of Ruth, you'll find in chapter number 1, she's in a far country. In chapter number 2, she's in the field. In chapter number 3, she's at his feet. Chapter number 4, she's in the family. Amen. Amen. Hey, that's a good turnaround right there. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a whole other message in, in, uh, in Ruth chapter number two. Uh, because in Ruth chapter number two, she asked the servants if she could go glean. In chapter four, they're her servants. <laughs> uh, over in chapter number two, uh, Ruth's allowed to rest at Boaz's house. In chapter four, it's her house. Amen. 
Uh, the field she gleaned in chapter number two, she owns it in chapter number four. Y'all want to get there, my grace. Amen. Uh, uh, what is the song they used to sing? I'm no longer an orphan. Amen. I've been adopted into the family. I want you to know this is not the end. There's a better day coming. I want you to realize that just any day now. Hey, listen. Don't you want to go? Amen. Ain't she excited about going? I talk about Sunday school, how wicked this world is, but I'm glad this world's not my home. I'm only passing through. Amen. Uh, I don't belong here. My citizenship lies somewhere else. Um, you, you know, some people say, well, preacher, why do you do that at work? Why you do that? Why you got to have Sunday off? Why, why do you got to uh, go to church? Why is it? How do you know you're right? Well, I, I, tell, uh, I tell people all the time, I say, listen, if you're wrong, you lose everything. I said, uh, if, if I'm wrong, I ain't lost nothing. Amen. I've just had a lot of joy for the journey, but I ain't wrong. Amen. And I know what I, I'm glad what it is. Ruth chapter 1 is about bitterness and blame. Naomi says, the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. Changed her name to Mara's bitter. She's, uh, uh, she's dire. She said, the Lord hath afflicted me. Well, I hate to bust your bubble, uh, Naomi. The last time I checked, it was Elimelech and Naomi that left, not God. Amen. It wasn't God said go down there to Moab. Elimelech well, decided he wanted to go somewhere else. And, and, and here she is blaming God for the place she's in. And she's blaming God for empty hands. And she said, I went out for and I come back empty. She's blaming God for an empty heart. She's blaming God because she's got an empty home. When in reality it was her fault. And Elimelech's fault. And all the bitterness and the blame that we say there. But can I say I'm glad the story don't end there. Amen. You get over to Ruth chapter number 2, verse number 18. Uh, and I know we're in Ruth chapter number 3, but I'm just uh, testifying for a minute. Uh, Ruth chapter number 2, verse number uh, uh, 19, it says over there, uh, when she come down, it says, And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Uh, this is what she's asking her, Where you been today? And she notices, she said, Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. Now, blessed this is the first time you find that word in the book of Ruth. Because she's been pouting the whole first chapter. Um, she'd been sad and sorrowful and she said blessed in verse number 20 Naomi said to her daughter-in-law blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead bitterness and blame we find it turned into blessing because of the grace of God that we find in the book of Ruth and, and, and we understand that you say well how did she go from bitterness to blessing how did she go from blame out of where she is right now one word Boaz I'll tell you how you go from it today. One word, Jesus. Amen. That's how you're going to have a difference in your life. That's how a difference is going to be made. Boaz, you know what what uh, what the shepherds were shouting about when uh, uh, when in Bethlehem the night Jesus was born. They were shouting because Boaz come on the field. Amen. They were shouting because the kinsman redeemer had come. They were shouting because life forever would be changed. They were shouting because I, I'm glad for the day Boaz walked out in my field. Amen. Made a difference. In chapters one through uh, chapters uh, in chapter one, you'll find six people are mentioned: Elimelech, Chilon, Malon, Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth. You know who the seventh person mentioned is? Boaz. Mm -hmm. Six is the number of man, but seven is the number of perfection. <coughs> Out walk Boaz. I, 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 I'm just, I'm just sharing with you. Amen. That's why I like the book of Ruth, man. You can find, follow this stuff all day long. I love it. Amen. I enjoy seeing this story. I, I, I want to get to the message. I, uh, in, in chapter 3 3, I, uh, I want to preach just for a few minutes on how to get where God is. Amen. How to get where God is. I think in our day and hour right now, uh, we feel so uh, separated. We feel so alienated. We feel uh, uh, feel like, uh, and we hear it in testimony and stuff on Wednesday nights and different things like that. That it, you know, I just don't feel like I'm I'm as close as I once was. Just not uh, exactly where I once was. And. And I want to tell you, so I want to be where God is. Amen. I don't want to be in no church where God ain't. Amen. I don't want to, as a matter of fact, I want to be on a job or in a car or, or in somebody's house where God ain't. I want to be where God is. Amen. And, and uh, we, as a church, need to figure out how we're going to get to where God is. We come into church so often and we go through the formality of church. 
We know the songs. We we know not to get the blue folder to get the green one or to or not get the green one but get the blue one. And we know how the songs go. And we know uh, that every now and again we have a special song or two that my family may sing or some of these girls or or we may have a, a choir get up here and sing and we sort of know that. We're trying to figure out how much singing is the preacher going to do based on how much time we believe he's going to preach and exactly what time we're going to be able to get out of here when it's all said and done. But I'll be honest with you, God ain't within 100 miles of that mess. Amen. God ain't on a timetable. God's not on your schedule. God, you see, the most important thing that can happen at Elvira today is for God to come down on this place. Amen. And it amazes me today that we come in here and we can sing songs like we've sung and, and hear Sunday school like we heard and still you can't get, a, you can't squeeze a shout out of nobody about what God's doing. Hard even to get even amen. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. The blood excites me. You know that? I, I, I like them songs we sing. Amen. I'm glad that uh, when we think about what we're saying that uh, sung a song called Glory Road. I'm glad. Yes, from where I am and from where some of you are. Hey, heaven's getting closer. I can see the lights of home. Amen. I'm nearing the shore. One of these days I'm going to outstrip this world. Amen. I ain't going to worry about this filth and what's going on here. That every step I take, Rodney, is another step. Just over the next horizon, I may be on the shores of glory. Amen. I'm getting closer every day. Amen. I know uh, when we travel down the road and, and we get down as we're going down from here to North Carolina and usually it's of the evening and night sets in. You go down that stretch of 81 uh, where there ain't nothing and, and uh, come across on 26 and as you get there, but as you as you near the city, you can see the, the sky sort of start to light up in the distance and you start making your way. Well, I'm at a place in my life I can see the sky lit up in the distance. Amen. It's not too much further, amen. Uh, as a matter of fact, trouble God may sound the day and I could be there today, amen. amen. I want you to realize we need to get to where God is. I want to be where God is. You say, well, preacher, I don't want to die. I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about getting to a place where God's first and foremost in your life. Everything we do, if we get to where God is, we'd have to build a bigger building. If we get to where God is, I wouldn't have to beg and plead and, and uh, uh, to, uh, ask people with all my heart for them to be at the church house. They'd be there. If we get where God is, revival would happen. If we get where God is, it changes community. And we get to a place where we're coming in here to worship God and just lay aside all the formality and all the regulation and all, all the rules and all the routine and, and come in here and just worship God. It'll make a difference today. Amen. 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 I'm sick of routine. I'm sick of I'm sick of going through the motions. I'm sick of hey listen, I'm gonna tell you something right now. I told Wednesday night. I'm sick of Wednesday night prayer meeting. I'm not sick of I'm not sick of the prayer meeting or prayer or whatever. I'm just sick of the formality of it. I'm sick of fitting things into a time schedule. I'm sick of doing things well. Let's pray, but let's make sure we're done praying by this time so we can get home on time and, and not be here too long. We're tying the hands of God. We're restricting the Holy Spirit. We're not allowing God to rule and reign. And it's affected our churches. Amen. Amen. I want to get where God is. I want to say when Ruth went to the threshing floor, she was not going to get a blessing. She done got that in chapter 2. That's when Naomi said it. Boy, you was blessed today. She was coming in chapter number 3, not for a blessing, but a bridegroom. She is coming to get married. Amen. That's why she went in there. And she was looking for a husband to redeem her. She wasn't no longer satisfied just getting stuff out of corners. See, all she was allowed as a, as a servant was to glean the corners of the field, whatever they left. But the corners, hey, when are you going to get to the point where the corner ain't good enough anymore? When are you going to get to the point where you want to get on out there in the field? When you don't want to just pick up the, the scraps? Amen. She didn't just want, she didn't want more of the field. She wanted the man that owned it. Amen. Amen. I'm glad one day I found the man that owned it. Amen. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You say, boy, you've got a lot of cows. No, I got God. Amen. 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 Let me say, how are we going to get where God is? Verse number three, we, uh, Naomi's giving her instructions here. And the first thing Naomi says, pretty simple here. She says, wash thyself. Wash thyself. We're going to get where God is. We need to be freshly cleaned. Amen. 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 I know some of you took a bath this morning. Some of you took a bath last night. Some of you ain't had one. I'm just going to be honest with you. Amen. Hey, some things Axe body spray don't cover. Amen. 
And uh, the truth of the matter is, I'm not talking about did you take a bath before you come to church. I, 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 what, what I'm saying is, uh, in, in Ruth life, where she was at this point in time in her life, she come into Naomi. Naomi's gave her a plan, but Ruth, she'd been out there in the field. She dirty. She been out there gleaning. She been out there uh, picking barley. She got the dirt of the world on you. I want you to know if you're going to get where God is, you want to get the dirt of the world off of you. Amen. Amen. You're going to have to. You're going to have to do that. We're going to have to. Uh, if we're going to get where God is and get to a place where God's going to bless us like He wants to, we're going to have to keep short accounts with God. I made a statement to you last Sunday morning, and that statement was like this. I heard a preacher say uh, in this statement, he said, what we call good Christianity today, 25 years ago, they'd have called you backslid. Yep. Amen. Amen. They'd say, what we're calling good Christianity today, living any way we want to, one foot dragging in the church, one foot dragging in the world, and then we say by comparison, well, that's a pretty good Christian. Hey, 50 years ago, they'd said you was lost. Hey man, I want you to know back 50 years ago, they wouldn't tolerate the way we live today. They wouldn't have tolerated it. I mean that right now. Churches turned you out 50 years ago for square dancing. Hey man, what do you think they'd do with us today? I, I, I want you to realize, we wouldn't make it. They used to preach against uh, television, but the internet far worse than television ever is. I want you to realize that. Uh, and I'm not necessarily preaching against either one of them because I don't think, just like I believe in the Second Amendment, my right to bear arms and that a gun don't kill people, but people kill people. I don't believe your TV picks the channels it's on or your internet searches websites for you. You're the one looking at that garbage. Amen. 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 I want you to understand uh, when we think about that, it, would you be willing uh, to give up some of it to get where God is? Would you be willing to turn off the TV to get where God is? Would you be willing to get off the internet to get where God is? Would you be willing to give up your hobbies and, and your fun and, and, and family time uh, to get where God is? Is it important for you to get where God is? Amen. Ruth could have said, Naomi, I love you. She done made that statement. Where you go, I'll go. I'll follow you. Your Lord, your God will be my God. I, I'm going to be with you all the way. And Naomi could have said, Ruth, I want you to go in there and lay Boaz's feet. And, and Ruth could have said, Naomi, I'd just like to stay here with you. I, I don't want to go over there. I don't want to leave you alone. If this guy does decide to marry me, then we're going to go our separate ways. And I don't want to do it. So I just want to stay here with you. She could have chose her family over getting where God was. I'm not saying to sacrifice your family. Make no mistake of what I'm saying. Uh, but I, I'm, getting, I'm getting sick and tired of people using their family as an excuse not to serve God. Amen. Because I believe those people that use their family as an excuse not to serve God are soon going to find themselves looking down in a casket because God's going to remove the excuse. Amen. You hear me? You hear me well. I'm telling you right now, I want to get where God is. Can you turn off your Facebook long enough? Now, some of you I know. I know when you're on Facebook, you want me to tell you why I know when you're on Facebook? Because my phone's got a little green light that tells me when you're on Facebook. <laughs> and then it's got a number, active, three minutes ago. Active. I wonder if we can turn that off long enough. I wonder if we can update our status with, uh, not I'm eating at the Waffle Hut, but with, I've got to go pray right now. I ain't got time to talk to you right now. I've got to, I've got to go set some time aside for God. I don't have, hey, listen, we can get together soon. Now, uh, you know how I feel about Facebook. Here's the way I feel about it. If I ain't seen you in 20 years, it's because I didn't want to see you for the last 20 years. Amen. Don't look me up. Don't find my number. Don't see where I'm at now. If I want you to know, the people that need to know where I'm at now know where I'm at now. Amen. And the people that I and don't bother me or I don't care if them know where I'm at, they don't know where I'm at. I want you to realize, uh, uh, looking at these things, I, I want you to know you've got, God deserves, when we talk about tithing, you'll throw money in offering plate, you say, and, and God, God, God's tithe is 10% of your money, 10% of your gross, not your net, but your, your, your gross, your original amount, get, render unto Caesar's what's Caesar, and give unto God what's God. You understand? I, I want God to get the top. God's first and foremost. God gets it first. That's what I'm saying. But guess what? Tithing ain't all you've got to give God. you got to give him time. You say, well, preacher, I ain't got time. I'm giving my job 40 hours a week. 10% of that's God's. Wouldn't it be the same principle? 10% of that job time? 10% of your family time? If 10% of my money's his, why ain't 10% of my time here? Well, preacher, I just ain't got that time to invest in God. Plus, you bring us church on Sunday morning, and you cover three hours worth of time, and that ought to cover me for the week. 
Give God your time. I wouldn't even regulate. I, I, just like I don't regulate my time to 10%, I don't do that. I don't want to give God just uh, just what it requires. I like to give a little bit over. I don't want to just say, okay, God, you've got the next uh, four hours here, and for the next four hours, I'm all yours. But after that, I'm going to be the heathen. I'm going to be the dirt bag. I'm going to keep going back and go watch whatever I want to. That's not what I'm saying. God deserves our time. If we're going to get where God is, we're going to have to spend some time with God and more time than I'm spending at Walmart and more time than you're spending at your job because these things weigh heavy on our mind. I don't want Walmart absorbing my mind. I want God to absorb my mind. I told my wife, I said, I'll quit that job the first day it keeps me awake at night. If I'm going to stay awake at night, I'll gladly do it praying over this church. I'll gladly do it uh, 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 sitting there and trying to get the sermon God wants me to have. I'll gladly do it if somebody's in the hospital. I'll gladly do it. But I ain't laying in my bed worrying about Walmart. Walmart worked before I got there and it'll work after I'm gone. I, I'm not going to let the world absorb my mind. Some of you laying in bed and you're thinking about everything in the world. Why does the world have more in your mind than God does? I can tell you why people ain't sleeping in the night because the world's got their minds. And they're thinking about all this stuff. You know what? I didn't sit around this morning uh, watching HBO before I come to church. I don't have HBO, but I'm just saying, I didn't sit around watching a bunch of secular TV. As a matter of fact, in my house, ain't no secular. I don't watch the news on Sunday morning. I don't watch it. If, 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 if there'd been a small fraction of a chance that there's a blizzard growing through, I might have tuned it on just to see what was going on with the weather and, and make a decision about uh, uh, church and what we needed to do today, and that could have been a possibility. But on Sunday morning, if I, TV comes on, I, I'm listening to preaching. I'm tuning it in. I'm talking about good preaching. I ain't just turning it on to the first person TV ends throwing out in front of me. Amen. I think there is some good preaching on Sunday morning. Not all of it's good preaching, but I, uh, but I do that. I don't watch a bunch of trash. I don't want my mind to uh, uh, absorb with a bunch of garbage before I come to God's house. I just don't want it. Amen. I want you to realize we've got to do it. I, I, I'm either watching preaching or I don't watch nothing. I don't listen to country music on the way to church. I don't listen to country music on the way to Walmart. I don't listen to country music. I don't listen to rap. I don't listen to rock. I don't listen to golden oldies. Well, preacher, them golden oldies wasn't bad. Did they draw you closer to God? Because if they ain't drawing you closer to God, why are you listening? Country music, man, I ain't got time to lose my family and dog and house in one morning. I don't have time to <laughs> I don't listen to it. I go out there and people say, boy, you heard this new. I don't know. I don't even know who that is. I don't even know who these people are singing. I don't know what they're singing. I don't know what they're talking about. I left country music a long time ago when country music quit being country. Amen. Hey, man. Uh, I, I don't do any of that. I know what I'm saying is, uh, why would you cover yourself up with filth and dirt of this world before you come to church and wonder why God can't do nothing with us? It don't make any sense to me. You can be clean without being a Pharisee. You know that? You don't have to be a legalist to be clean. You can do it. When I was young, if I skipped bath day, my mama, she'd come in there and she'd take a washcloth and she barely even got it wet. She'd set the scrub and it'd feel worse than washcloth ever. Ever did. I mean, she'd skin the hide off. I'd be sitting in church, maybe didn't wash behind my ears. Mama would sit over and look at me, she'd lick that thumb, and she'd go scrubbing behind my ear and give me a, 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 a kitten bath, I guess, what you call it. I, I'm thinking, she wanted us to be clean, you understand? She wanted us to, uh, uh, to do that. And, and uh, uh, I realized it was a little easier and less embarrassing for me to just go ahead and get cleaned up. Before I got there, Mama had to lick her thumb and, and start giving me a bath. And so I started taking a bath on my own. Making sure it was done. You keep yourself clean, spiritually speaking. If you keep your short accounts with God, you don't have to worry about getting uh, having to go in and, and get scoured off completely on Sunday morning. Keep short accounts with God. You can do that. I wonder how many of you today, if I just went out there and just took your, your car key and the ignition and just, just twisted it over to the accessory panel, what kind of music could blow me out the door? You say, what are you saying? I, well, uh, you say, preacher, I wouldn't want you to do that. That embarrass me. Well, I wished it would. The problem is today, I can go out there and do it. Some of you ain't embarrassed about it at all. That's the biggest problem. 
You remember Alan we used to have church, man, you stand four people, and people's really ashamed of their sin. I mean, you could see they'd get broken tears and get in their eyes, and that's realizing, I mean, for the years, man, they'd come to the altar and you knew, you knew the Holy Ghost of God got them, and that day is at the point where they ain't saying, I'm sorry I got caught. They're saying, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. And you could watch them get broken and watch them come from the back of the church house and make their way up the altar because they was ashamed of where they were, and they'd get in the altar and get right. Now you can preach and you can know the person you're preaching to sitting right there. And they ain't one bit ashamed of where they're living. I'm telling you, no conviction in the way we dress. No conviction in what we watch. No conviction in what we hear. Let me tell you something about your clothes. If you can't keep it up, don't have it on. <laughs> People running around. My mama taught me to wear a belt. And it's tough. I have to wear a belt tight. I was not built so good in the gluteus maximus to wear my britches and stay up. So I have to keep my pants pulled tight. I really should wear suspenders all the time. But that's just the you, you, you understand <laughs> And uh, I do, I mean, I'll take a belt, I'll pull her, I'll pull her satchel tight, suck her in, because if I don't, in just a few minutes, I, but I ain't never been one of those guys that, uh, 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 going around my clothes falling off. I, I don't like it. I it ain't just guys, it's girls, they uh, run around. But but uh, let's just say this, if you can't keep it up, don't put it on. How about that? Yeah. Good. Amen. I could go in a lot of detail about different things, but if God can't convict you, I can't. Amen. So the first thing we need to do is be freshly cleansed. Notice what else it says. Wash thyself therefore. And then notice this phrase. He said, and anoint thee. Anoint thee. That means be freshly consecrated. Anoint thee. That's different than being washed. You understand? That's different than being washed. It's two different commands. If it's the same thing, they wouldn't say the same thing twice. Uh, but when you think about an anointing, it's, it speaks of sanctification. It speaks of being set apart. It, it's like a perfume. It's like a fragrance. Now this morning I took a bath. I washed good. I know because I got that uh, black pepper and sage shampoo uh, from a Dollar Shave Club, you know, so I come in here and smell a piece of sausage, I guess. <laughs> Let's put sausage in a bottle. That's what a man wants to smell like. But anyway, I threw that on. I had a shower. I was good and clean. I got my clothes on. But you know what I done after that? I went over the shelf and got a little smell good. And uh, I sprayed me a little bit. I, 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 I perfumed myself. I anointed myself. I was clean. When's the last time you came to the house, God? And you were clean, but you took it a step further. And before you got there, you'd slipped off in a secret place and, and got along with God. And you said, God, I'm not putting this on for the pastor. I'm not putting this on for the congregation. I'm not putting this on for my husband or my children. I'm putting this on especially for you. See, she's telling Ruth, she said, hey, you go clean yourself, but you put a little smell good on. See, Boaz is going to be laying there, and he's going to be tossing and turning about midnight, but he's going to be a whiff that catches his nose. He's going to be like, what is that? That ain't barley. He's going to be afraid. What's going on? Maybe he feels somebody's at my feet. What's that that smells so good around? You know what I want to do? I want to anoint myself when I come in here. So the fragrance of the fact that I've spent time, I want to be so close with God that his fragrance becomes mine. That I walk in here and do that. It's amazing how much fragrance really affects you and your memories. I'm going to some stores or some place that I can smell something that take me right back to childhood. I remember, and I've shared this with you before, when, uh, uh, when Hannah was little, we walked into a store one time, and she walked in there, and she said, it smells like Christmas in here. And I knew exactly what she was talking about, because the fragrance, the, the cinnamon, the apple, that, that fragrance in the air, it, it was a, a Christmas, Christmassy smell. That's where it took her mind, right, to uh, Christmas and, and different things like that. It, it, it's an amazing thing. There's certain fragrances that smell like Home, there's fragrances that smell like your spouse. I know a lot of people that's lost their spouse. They still uh, own the clothing and things like that. You can still smell that fragrance that takes your mind back and, and, and does that. I, I'm going to be honest. Most of the time when you come to church, your odor is not pleasing to God. I'm not talking about sweat. I'm not talking about body odor. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. You've still got the stink of the world on you. But if you'll find a special place, and I'm talking about a place in the presence of Almighty God, you just say, if you get up on Sunday morning, I was thinking this morning, I get in there and uh, got a closet. My closet ain't no bigger than, in, than nothing. Well, I mean, it's pretty big. It's got a lot of clothes in it. So the place I got left, no bigger than nothing. But you get right in there and you get just, just enough place for you to get down on your face for God. 
and say, God, I just want your fragrance on me today. I just want to anoint myself today. I want to get to the place where you come. I wonder when's the last time you got it on you. I wonder when's the last time you see people say, Preacher, Lord, I, I, I pray before I come to church today. Yeah, but you didn't spend that long time with God. You may have said words, but you didn't wait for him to say it back. You've come to church and you pray for your pastor, but uh, we, we sometimes when we pray, we're just telling God things and we say, man, we don't wait till God says things to us. And then we wonder why our prayer life's done. Do you make a difference some of us get along with God and say, God, I love you. The only reason I'm here right now is I, I just want to be in your presence for the Lord. I ain't got nothing to say. I ain't got nothing to ask for. I ain't got nothing that I'm, I'm needing you to do for me. Yes, they are needs and they are other things, but right now, I just want to be in your presence for a little while and let your fragrance lay. The Bible says you draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Amen? You want me to tell you why God ain't near you? Because you ain't draw, drew nigh. He said, watch thyself. She said, watch thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee. We need to be fashionably clothed. Clothed for the occasion. Put the raiment on. Naomi said this, hey, you're going to change clothes. You say, why would, why would Naomi make a statement like that? Well, as far as I can tell in the story, we're just three chapters in there, and, uh, but Ruth had the wrong type of clothes on. And I, I don't know that maybe the last time uh, she had had her mourning garments on because she would lost her husband. And she had been in mourning. They would dress that mourning process for the Jews would last several days. Uh, I mean, it would be a process. Maybe uh, she left Moab but with those funeral clothes on and, and uh, was there and, and uh, was under this morning period. I think maybe for the first time since her husband died, Naomi says, time to get out of them dead clothes. Time to get out of them grave clothes. Time to get out of those that's reminding you of your past. Time to get out of those things that's uh, a constant reminder where you are. It's time to move on. And she says, time to get out. It's time for a new start because we're not going for a funeral. We're going for a wedding proposal. You can't get engaged in funeral clothes. Now, we do because I may wear this to a funeral, you may wear that to a funeral, but I, I legitimately back in the days when they went to funeral, they wore a funeral clothes. I'm talking about black and veils over the faces and stuff like that. You don't want to come in. There's some weddings, uh, I had a woman come to me this week said, would you marry me? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> well, what for? What, what for? I said, I, I said I, I'm just not going to do it. I said, I, I, I said, I ain't going to have part of that. I said, what is this, number three? Our first two didn't work out. You can't expect me to come in here and step in and save the day. I can't do that. I said, I, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and the reason being, as far as spiritually speaking, go spiritually clothing on, uh, uh, some of these weddings are dead before they start. And so I, I, I'm just telling you right now, uh, we have Na uh, Naomi saying here, she's like, listen, you've got your garments on of the past. You've got your garments on of your sin. You've got the garments on of who you were. You've got the, hey, she said, but you need to get out of those garments of your past and hide your sin and what you were. They, she said, guess what? They still wedding dress in that closet somewhere. Now, it might have been a while since you've pulled it out and looked at it. It might have been a while since you've done it. I imagine she's going out. Uh, but I, maybe the reason you can't worship God because you've got the wrong clothes on. I'm not talking physically speaking. I'm talking spiritually speaking. I'm talking about being clothed, right? Let me tell you something. Hey, if you're willing to change your garments today, there was a day when I took off the old coat and I put on the new. There was a day when I put off the old man and I put on the new. The chains of my past were broken at last. Amen. I got saved. Amen. Amen. I want you to realize right now, I remember, uh, I remember one time I was... Uh, when uh, Chloe was little, I went deer hunting one day, and uh, I'd come back and I'd throw off my uh, hunting jacket and all that stuff, and I was wearing some of this uh, Under Armour underneath my hunting clothes and, and things like that, and I sat down in my chair, and Chloe came up there and she climbed in my lap and she laid her head against my chest started crying. Got down out and walked, uh, I said, what in the world went on? And, and I remember uh, that I couldn't get her to calm down, and, and it was the material that shirt was made of. She did not like the way that shirt felt when she laid her head against my chest. She, she's just real little, but she's always, always would come to her daddy. But I was like, what in the world's going on? And, and I figured out it was that material. She just she didn't like letting us. It wasn't what she wanted. It was, uh, I, and, and I'm telling you right now, could it be the reason that God won't get close to us? 
is because he don't like the way what we're wearing feels against him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then maybe he's saying, I don't want nothing to do it. I can see Naomi say it. It's time to hang up those morning clothes. It's time to put on a wedding dress. I can see Naomi going over there in the closet maybe and starts digging and stuff. Had a lot to go through. She's digging around back in there and I think maybe she got down back to the back, back in the bag and she pulls it out and she unfolds it and here it is, wedding garment. And she says, all right, put this wedding garment on. You say, how do you know it's a wedding dress? I, I don't, but I do know she had a veil and Boaz filled it up. Amen. And so she got, she come in there. She wasn't gonna dress like she's cleaning. Amen. She's dressed like she's coming to marry. And so Boaz tells her over there. He said, "Bring me the veil that thou hast upon you." Boaz says, "Give me that veil, or I'm gonna load you down." And so that's why it's another one of the great phrases in Ruth. He, he says he uh, measured six uh, measures of barley and he laid it on her. Amen. Ain't that the way Jesus does? He just lays it on you. Amen. And, and so we find that she does that. And so Boaz says, "Bring me the veil. I can see her putting on that wedding dress." Don't feel like it'll burn out. It don't feel like them old garden clothes and them morning clothes. This one feels different. And old burn out bags that she was wearing and them old morning clothes she was wearing. There was no way to look at yourself in the mirror and think, boy, I sure look pretty today. Not like we do at funerals today. We do different for funerals today than they used to do. Used to when you had a funeral. And by the way, when they had a funeral, they'd fast. Now we have funerals and we're calling everybody in the country, bring chicken, bring mashed taters, bring we don't want them starving to death while they're not happy. Used to when they had a funeral, they'd fast and they'd pray. They'd just lost somebody. They'd get closer to God. They'd draw nearer. But now you come in there and you got more food than you, than you know what to do with. But uh, now we go to the funeral and we're like, boy, this is a funeral. I want I want to look nice for a funeral. I, I want to make sure. Do I, do I look pretty? My grandfather just died a few weeks ago. Man, you ain't never seen so much pride and prim. And I've seen, I seen my people wearing clothes that I ain't never seen them wear. I was like, my hats. They had hats. Great old beggings, you know, with a little veil that hung down. And I was thinking, what in the world is going on here? But they wanted to look good for the funeral. But that wasn't the way it used to be when, when, when uh, Ruth was mourning her husband. She wasn't talking about looking good. She wanted to look like she was mourning. But now here she's got on a dress, and now for the first time she can look as if she's been washed. She smells good. She's got that on her. And, and the Bible says uh, it don't smell like the barley field. It don't smell like the cemetery. It don't smell like the grave clothes. You want to get closer to God, put you something fresh on I'm talking about the garments of righteousness. I'm talking about what he did. Uh, get to get thyself. And it said, she said this. And she says, it shall be when he lieth down, thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay down. Now, he, will tell, he will tell thee what to do. So here's Ruth. She's all pretty up. Got her, got her hair fixed. Got her perfume on. That wedding dress. Creeping out through there in the night. Goes into that threshing floor. Finds Boaz laying down there on the floor and she just goes down and she lays right at his feet. He says, It came to pass the men out the man was afraid to turn himself. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art near kinsman. The Bible says, verse 14, she lay at his feet in the morning. She rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known the one will come. And he said, Bring me the veil that thou hast upon me and hold me. And when he held it, she made her six and laid it on her, and she went to the city. And verse number 18 says, Sit still, my daughter. Until I know how the matter will fall for this man will not be in rest. Until he finishes this thing and stuff. Do you know what's going to happen if we'll be freshly cleansed and if we'll be frequently, conse frequently consecrated? Not just do it once a week, stay that way. To be fast, to be clothed, clothed like he is. Boaz ain't going to stop. Our heavenly Boaz ain't going to stop till we get exactly what we've come for. I am sick of going through the motions at church. I'm sick of it. I know you. If you've been in church any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I could write a book right now on how a service is supposed to work. You, you could. Most of you in this building could. Come in, do this, sing happy birthday, take up the offering plate. You know, make sure to sing three or four songs, depending on how people are responding and singing. <laughs> but standing back there, I was like, I got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. <laughs> Down in my heart, yes, down in my heart. I got joy, 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 down in my heart. Well, usually like that, we're only going to sing a couple. 
But there's some days we come in here, man, and you can sing a song. I, I mean, I, it, it could be Mary had a little lamb, but there's different spirit in this place. There's different touch. You, you, you've put the time in, and God has, God has approved. And God shows up. Now, you can hear it. You can hear it in the songs being sung, and it's a whole different spirit on this place. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine this week. He said, man, the strangest thing happened to me. I said, what happened? He said, I got up to church last Sunday. Well, he asked me how my services went. I said, our services went great. I said, how, how George go? He said, terrible. He said, I got up there. He said, we tried to sing. He said, that's choking to death. He said, I got up there. He said, my family got up to sing. They were trying to sing. He said, they choked to death. They couldn't sing. It just like, he said, I tried to get up there and say some words. And he said, I, he said, everything is so bad. He said, I just shut her down and sent them home. <clears throat> I said, well, I said, I hate to hear that. He said, Do I? I said, I wonder what caused it. I said, well, I'll tell you what caused it. People didn't prepare for worship. What, what caused it? So he spent about 20 minutes up there telling people how tight it was in there this morning and somebody ain't right with God and somebody's choking in your death and somebody's like that. I said, I don't ever do that. I said, I don't get up there and let you know something's choking me to death. I said, I just get up there and try to preach a devil out of the place. I said, don't get up there. I said, the more you tell people something's in there and there's a spirit in there and it's choking you to death, then the more they're like, hey, they're not getting in the mind to worship. I said, no. I said, we've got to prepare ourselves. I said, the bottom line is, if I've spent time with God this week, then I'm going to meet with God when I come. And if I can't meet with God for some reason, I'll find me a place in this altar and say, God, listen, I've messed up somewhere along the way. Now, you can sit there like a wooden Indian if you want to, but your worship don't affect mine. Amen? And I've been in them places where it's tight. But the tighter it is, I just wind up and I'll, I'll, preach, I'll preach a devil out of it. Because the bottom line is I've spent too much time trying to get with God, too much time trying to get anointed, too much time trying to get ready to come in here on Sunday morning and let the devil steal it away from us because somebody didn't. But we can eliminate that when we do what we're supposed to do. I'm talking about getting where God is. Amen. Now, there will be a day I will be where God is. Hopefully, that's a little bit of time away. I'm not looking to take the next bus. But I'm talking about in this church. I want God to approve of us so that God comes here. Amen. So that God, I, I, listen, we shouldn't come to church saying, God, come down to us. He doesn't come down to us, died on the cross for our sins, and went back up. It's about time we say, God, lift us up to where you are. Hey. I don't want you down here on this earthly <laughs> level. I want to come into church and enter into the heaven. I want to enter into the place where you are. I want to transcend and be where God is. But you ain't going to do that dirty. And Ruth wasn't going to do that dirty. If you want what you can get out of Boaz, then let me tell you something. You're going to have to get yourself ready to worship God. We're going to have to clean ourselves. We want to get where God is. We're going to anoint ourselves. We're going to clothe ourselves. There's some things God's not going to do for you. When I was a baby, my mama bathed me. When I got grown, I had to learn to bathe myself. In the Bible, the Bible says, anoint thyself, cleanse thyself. There's things you've got to do, and it's up to you to do them. I wonder when's the last time you made yourself presentable because you were going to meet with God. Did you know if you got a phone call a few years ago and the president wanted to meet with you, boy, you'd have dressed up, you'd have wore your very best. I say a few years ago because honestly, I don't know if I'd make the trip if he called the day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, if one of the greatest, man, Abraham Lincoln was living, Abraham Lincoln said, boy, I want to be, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I'd say, I'm going to meet the president. I'm going to go see the president. And I'd dress up and I'd go and, and, and do what I can to, to make myself look as good. Listen, there's somebody far, far greater than the president. Far greater than the kings of this land. Far greater than any manager or boss or employer in the world. And it's King Jesus I want to be as close to him as I possibly can. I don't want nothing interfering between me and God. We've got to get where God is. Let's stand with heads by our eyes closed.